Good morning. Welcome to a brand new sermon series we are starting today uh, that is called Psalm 23. I bet you cannot guess what scripture we are in. Psalm 23 is something that has been on my heart for a while as something I really wanted to uh, dig deeper into. And so for the next five weeks, that is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to dig into Psalm 23. It is all of six verses. And so we are going to spend five weeks on six verses. And I think what you will see is we could spend five years on it. The beauty of the scripture is a gift to us. God's gift to us is his word. And so one of the things I would love for us to get from these five weeks is to be able to memorize this psalm that is applicable to every stage and every season of our lives. And so uh, part of what we have done to try to create an, a full month engagement in Psalm 23 is we have a devotional that you heard about last week if you were here. I wrote a devotional for 30 days to go along with the series, and it basically works like this. On uh, Sunday, this is the hard part, you come to church, okay? That's all you gotta do. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, there is a day related to what we learn on Sunday. And it just walks you through with a short, little, one paragraph lesson and then a a prayer to go along with that. It's a daily rhythm. And what I want us to do is to just deeply dive into this psalm. To get the, the, you know, if it's the fruit, you know, when you really like a good piece of fruit in the summer, you get a fresh peach and it's just dripping all over you and you just love it. That's what I want us to do with Psalm 23, is to just get so excited that we are fully covered in this psalm and that we can walk the rest of our lives with the access to this good gift that God has given us. And so to do that, uh, we've made it available for you today. It's free if you wanna get a digital copy. So you go to the website on the screen and you go and click on there and you can have a digital copy. We have a a paper copy as well. So if you wanna buy a paper copy because you just like paper, uh, you are welcome to do that. But we made the digital copy free If you have a computer, a smartphone, a tablet, anything basically, if you have a brain, you can do digital copy totally free. We want anybody who wants it to have it. The other thing I'm gonna do is every single uh, day, the page for the day, the devotional page for the day will be posted on Facebook for Grace Point uh, Medical Center. And so you have the opportunity there, if you're doing it with a life group, you can comment as what you've learned for the day, you can share it with someone who may live six states away who you think, man, I wish they could hear this. What we wanna do is make it plainly available that every single day you have access and that we as a community walk through this together. And so I would encourage you to take advantage of all those things, get it in any way you wanna get it or don't. Um, But what we're gonna be doing for the next five weeks is looking at God's uh, provision, his peace, his protection, his prosperity, and then his presence. And those are gonna be our five weeks. And so like I said, we have six verses and five weeks. And so this week we are going to focus on verse one, 23 verse one. Before we do that, what I'd like to do is read the whole thing together. Like I said, part of my hope is that we would memorize this. That if we sit in this one scripture for five weeks that we would all leave here pretty sure we could memorize it. And you know parts of it already. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The valley of the shadow of death. And these are things we've heard that are just familiar to the world. And yet what I want us to do is get beyond familiar and get into a place where it is deeply rooted within us. So if you look on your screens, if you have your uh, bulletin, you take out the sermon notes and turn it over. Your scripture is there as well. Your Bible, your smartphone, however you read the Bible, let's read it together and you can read it with me. All right. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word. This is your gift to us, and I pray that as we uh, walk into a season and a series where we are going to get deep into this word, Father, that you will illuminate it for us. 
that you'll remove distractions, that you will remove all the impediments, and that, Father, we would find ourselves longing for more of you, and that we would discover you, find you, and know you better through this. And so, Father, I pray that you would show us favor this month as we attempt to memorize, as we attempt to uh, drink deeply of your goodness, so that we not would just have it for ourselves, but God, that we might live it out and see a world in darkness turn to light. And so, Father, we love you, and we thank you for it, Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. So, today is total provision. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is fundamentally, I think, as we start this psalm, this is a perspective shift for us. What it's saying is the Lord is my shepherd. A shepherd oversees the sheep, right? And so if the Lord is my shepherd, then he is um, here and I am here. He is above and I am a lowly sheep, I am below. And this may not seem like a world-changing radical thing, but if I'm honest, and I don't know about you, but typically I see the world through a pretty me-centric lens. If, if I had a bad day, it was a bad day, right? If, if something wrong in my life is going on, then that's pretty much all I feel and see. My world is, it kind of everything rotates around me most of the time. I'm me-centric. That is what it is to be human, is to not really have the daily perspective to see that there are seven billion people and it can't rotate around each of us. And so what this does first and foremost is it drives us back to the idea that the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is the shepherd and we are the sheep. A shepherd is totally responsible for his sheep. What they eat, when they drink, their protection, their safety, anything that the sheep need is provided by the shepherd. And so the question we start with today is what do you yearn for? When he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, what is it that you want? Like if we're honest with ourselves, deep down in our souls, what is it that we want? What is it that we yearn for in our hour of need, in our worst day? What, what is it that we go, man, if I just had blank, then it would all be okay. See, a sheep is totally dependent on the shepherd. We don't like being dependent either. We are Americans. We are independent. We don't have Dependence Day. You guys, you notice that? July 4th is coming up. We don't celebrate Dependence Day. That's when I gave up control of my life and I surrendered to the Lord Jesus. Let's have fireworks. Like, we don't do that. No one does that. We have Independence Day. This is when we push the tea into the ocean and we shot all the British people and now we're independent. And then we shoot off fireworks to just make sure if anybody thinks they're going to come and attack us, look at all the fireworks we have. We will, you know, we're independent. Look at all the hot dogs I just ate. I'm still kicking. Let's go. And that's Independence Day. And it's a little bit insane. But that's because that's what we celebrate. That's a value, independence. To be sheep to a shepherd means to be fully dependent upon something greater. And this runs counter to our culture. When the sheep want shade from the sun, when they want refuge from the storm, the shepherd is the one who provides it. He guides them under the tree. He guides them into the fold. He, he takes care. This is probably because sheep are dumb. I don't know if you knew that. I grew up in the city. But from the people I ask, they tell me sheep are dumb. Sheep are like the, the animal kingdom equivalent of lemmings. If, you, if the shepherd leads the sheep over the cliff, they just keep going. They're just not very smart. It's not hard to get the sheep into market to be slaughtered. You just kind of walk one in and they just follow the one behind them. They don't know whether they're getting sheared or slaughtered and they don't really care. They're just sheep. They're dumb and they're really vulnerable. You know, like, like fluffiness is not a good defense mechanism in nature. Did you know that? <laughs> this might be the chief uh, argument against evolution, which, you know, we could have that debate another day, but what did the sheep ever evolve into? It's just, it's just fluffy. I don't know, what bounce, the wolf bounces off the, I don't know. The sheep are vulnerable. What can they do? They just bah, and that's about it, and it's over. They're dumb and they're vulnerable, which is, this is the first insult, right? Let's get into the insult. That's us. This is what the scripture is saying. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So if the Lord is my shepherd, then I am the sheep, which would say that I am dumb and vulnerable. 
And while that is offensive to me, because God has given you gifts and God is, you, as humans, we have uh, elevated intelligence over all the others and we do have all these gifts and we are not like uh, total morons. But when it comes down to it, we get ourselves in some pretty strange situations. And if we look around, we are really vulnerable to all the schemes of the enemies around. Sheep can't provide for themselves, and if they could, they wouldn't know what they needed. This is uh, well applied if you come to my house. Uh, uh, any morning of any day of any time of my entire life, I have a four-year-old, and uh, every morning uh, we have breakfast out for them. And, you know, we're not crazy people. We're not granola and grapefruit. They, like, they get normal food, tacos or uh, cereal or cinnamon rolls or whatever. Right, so she's not starving. And yet every morning, I would bet my life on this, she will ask me at some time before 8 a.m., Dad, can I have some candy? <laughs> when have I ever said, I've never said yes to this before, you know, like, no, why, what, I just, and then she gets her like little cute, I'm four, I'm your baby fa face going, and she's like, but I, oh, Dad, I really need some candy. <laughs> you know, she's just weak with that. <laughs> I fructose corn syrup. You know, she's just, she's dying for it. To which I say, no, right? I'm a good dad, I'm strict. I hold a hard line. No candy before 8.15, right? That's, that's how that works. Um, but that's what she thinks she needs. It's what she wants for sure, but it's what she thinks she needs every morning. Oh, dad, I really, oh, you know. And then, you know, she eats something normal and she feels better and she just goes away and forgets about it. Wants and needs are not the same thing. And here's the interesting thing. When our needs are met, we're not left wanting. So my wife and I got taken to dinner recently to a place we could not afford. This is a recurring theme in my life if you've not noticed this, but a nice couple said, hey, we'd like to treat you. It, it's, it had been a long week for us. It had been a long day for us. We were kind of depleted, exhausted, all these things. They said, just let us, let us take care of you. We looked at each other and we're like, okay, sure. So we went to this nice Italian restaurant, something that we wouldn't have chosen for ourselves. And, and we sat down and I was famished. Like I'd had um, nothing that day basically to eat. I was just kind of like rolling. And I looked at this menu and knowing they were paying, right? I wanted to be really gentle about it. And I was like, one of everything, <laughs> just all of it. Dessert first, you know? A slice of cheesecake, whole cheesecake, the whole, you know, this is what I wanted. It's what I wanted, because I was hungry. So they bring out, you know, we order and they bring out, I got a salad to start and that was really good. And then eggplant Parmesan, I was like, this is good. All melty and wondrous spaghetti. It's almost lunchtime, y'all. Mmm. <laughs> and I stuffed myself. I ate every last morsel of everything they brought me and she came back and she goes, okay, who's ready for dessert? Not me. I don't want dessert. Why? My needs were met. The thing I walked in wanting, one of everything and all of your dessert, tiramisu, just, just dump it on me and I'll lick it off. It'll be fine. That's what I wanted. What I needed was nutrition. What I needed was nutrients to restore my body. And when I got them, what I needed changed what I wanted. You ever go grocery shopping on an empty stomach? Yeah? Man, this is the secret sin, right? You come home with like a car full of groceries. Your spouse is looking at you. She's, What's for dinner? And you're like, um, I got Twinkies, <laughs> nine bags of Doritos, and I bought a flat screen. You know, you're like, well, what do you want? I was really hungry. I don't know. I just, I had no control. This is what we do. You're never supposed to grocery shop hungry because everything looks great. You cannot distinguish between what you want and what you need anymore. It's all, it's just all a blur. You ever try to return Doritos to H-E-B? It's really awkward, so <laughs> don't do that. But when you grocery shop and you just ate, you're able to focus on what you really need and what you need and want, they kind of blend. David picks up on this as the psalmist the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He seems to be saying that if God is our shepherd, if we rest in him, if we rest on his provision, then we will not be lacking for anything. We will not want because we will have all we need. 
And we don't see it that way often. We want what we want when we want it. And we don't recognize the reason we want it is because we don't have what we need. And so the first thing Psalm 20, 23 teaches us is if you have what you need, then you shall not want. Jesus picks up on this theme in uh, John 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd though, who is not the owner of the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and he is not concerned about the sheep. I'm the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Jesus is juxtaposing a shepherd and hired hands. And what you would do is if you had too many sheep, you would have to hire other people to watch certain numbers of them. The problem is, only the shepherd cares about his sheep. Only the shepherd is concerned with the well-being of the sheep. The hired hand is just there for the paycheck. And so for us to know the difference, what is it in our life that is the shepherd? Who is that? And then what are the hired hands? See, we live in a world full of false shepherds. False things that will uh, say they want to guide us, to lead us, to help us, to supply us. Those hired hands, those false shepherds in our life are not concerned about us. And so I would ask, what hired hands are you looking to for provision in your life? Meaning, what are you looking to to provide significance or meaning or healing? What are you looking to to provide hope for your days? Sex, money, status, power, career, control. These are some of the things that we place our hope in, we place our significance and we place our lives in. They are the hired hands. And the problem is, no matter how much control you have, you are never in control because there are always things beyond your own. No matter how much money you have, there are things you can't afford and there are people who make more. No matter how much of any of these things you have, A, it's never enough to satisfy, and B, when tough times hit, Hired hands are not concerned about you. And so when life gets out of control and you're left gripping and trying to hold on, it doesn't care. It'll throw you where it wants to throw you. And when the career you've worked so hard for, when, when you work for Enron and it's 2000, and all of a sudden this company you've poured your life into goes belly up under no fault of yours, your career's not concerned about you. All of these hired hands are things that tempt you into thinking they are the provider of your life, and yet none of them are concerned about you, and when storms hit, when trials come, none of them provide. They all fail. They all flee when the wolf comes near. In the hands of the world, I always need more to be satisfied. In the hands of the good shepherd, I lack nothing. I shall not want. So it's as if you and I are hungry for God. Scripture says that we are wired to want God. Eternity has been sown into our very being. We know that there's this greater thing for us. And so what we find ourselves doing is we are basically grocery shopping through life, hungry for God. And yet everything we see on the shelves of life, a little bit of control, a little bit of power, these are all things we're trying to supplement. And maybe this can help me. Maybe this can help me. Maybe this can help me. And what we need Ultimately, what we need as we shop through life hungry for God is we need God. And if we had God, all these other things would pale in comparison. We would no longer be attracted to power. Because what's power? Because my king who loves me, who died for me, has conquered the grave. What power could I have that would be greater than him saying he loves me and he saved me? There's nothing. When you're rightly ordered, all those other things, all those other hired hands are no longer attractive. But it requires us to see the world as it is, as a shepherd and sheep. Jesus talks about knowing his voice. My sheep will know my voice. What voice do you answer to? Or maybe more concretely, 
What is the dominant voice in your life? Is it ESPN? Is that, I mean, like literally, is that the dominant voice? That's the voice you hear most? Is it a friend? Is it Facebook? What are they saying about me today? What is the voice that you are looking to and listening for to guide you? Because life is hard. We get distracted, life is complicated, and what we end up doing is going to the easiest voice to hear. I can flip this channel on, I can just zone out. I can scroll through this, I can just zone out. If I can, and what we don't recognize is we are giving our lives to hired hands. And then they let us down and we wonder why we feel so unfulfilled. Jesus not only says, I will provide the voice of Jesus. He not only says, I will provide, but when there was no other way, Jesus gave himself and became provision. When there was no other option to save you and I, Jesus said, not only am I going to tell you I'm going to provide, but watch this. And he climbs on the cross and he takes the penalty for our sin and he says, I am not only telling you I will provide, I am provision itself. Total provision. Which is why we can say, I shall not want. Because what else is there? What else could we possibly imagine? Paul says in Romans 8, 31 and 32, he says, what then shall we say? If God is for us, who is against us? He, God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? He's saying he gave you his most prized possession. He laid Jesus on the cross so that you and I might live. And what lesser things are we worried about? What are the lesser things we're going, I don't know if God will provide that for me. I gotta get it for myself. Or I gotta rely on this. Or I gotta go trust this hired hand. And I gotta cobble it together because I don't know if God's really for me. He hadn't answered my prayer yet. I don't know if God loves me. I don't know if God, what? He gave his son. His only son, his most prized possession. And he sends him to be sacrificed for you and I. What lesser things are we sitting on going, I don't know if God will provide. In the hands of the father, we lack nothing. He has been proven faithful. God's extravagant love is on display. So the psalmist sits down and he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because the good shepherd is the great provider. Because in our hour of greatest need, God sent the most precious, costliest gift. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. It's not just a metaphor. Jesus is not just speaking in metaphor, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. It's a meta-narrative. It's the overarching meta-narrative over all of history that Jesus himself fulfilled. Imagine being his disciples in the moment and Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. And the disciples have to be going, huh. Like, it's like someone should tweak that. That's really, that's a pretty good quote, Jesus. That's a good metaphor. To which Jesus says, just wait. And you flip forward a couple pages in, in history and you see Jesus finds himself on the cross and the disciples are scattered. Not only are they overwhelmed by what's just happened, it took them by surprise because not even they could imagine that someone would love them so much so as to give themselves on another's behalf. And you and I live under that fulfilled promise every day. We have the beauty of history. We can see backwards and go, wow, he loved me so much. He loved you so much. Part of the problem is salvation is free to us. We don't value free things very well in our culture. The Spurs game not long ago and they laid t-shirts over every chair, you know. I'm a big guy, obviously I work out a lot, but um, the 2XL shirt that they gave me, not real helpful, right? Like Steph and I got in it together, we each had one arm out, we could do that thing. It was like a good Halloween costume. But I'm like, I don't know what to do with this free shirt. It's free, I didn't pay for it. It's worthless to me. So you can do this or you can wipe off nachos from the seat, you know, when you spill them or whatever. You just leave it there because what are you going to do? It's free. 
If I'd spent 30 bucks on it, I bet I'd taken it with me. But it is free, I don't know, whatever. We don't value free stuff. Which is, which is a tough thing to swallow because salvation is free to us. And as a result, we undervalue our very salvation because it didn't cost us anything. It didn't cost us anything. And so it requires us to take this perspective, the Lord is my shepherd and I am his sheep. It requires me to look at it that way and to go, even though it didn't cost me anything, it cost God everything. And in that moment, we get a right understanding of who we are. In the shadow of grace, we get to understand who we are and where we stand. You experience that on some small level when I go to dinner with somebody who pays for a bill I could never afford. That's a small thing, and yet I still sit in, in like kind of gratitude to this person. Not guilt that I couldn't afford it, but gratitude that they would just lavish upon me love. And yet that's our very existence, that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. The costliest thing we can imagine, he lavished upon us. And so we shouldn't be guilt-ridden that Jesus had to die because I'm a sinner. We should be so grateful. We wake up every day and go, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, because anything I could ever want, he already gave me in Jesus, whom I needed more than I ever knew. And this is the beauty of this scripture. We have a good shepherd. In our weakness as sheep, he provides strength. In the storms of life, he is rescuer and he's redeemer. He has never forsaken us. He will not forsake us because we have a shepherd who can be trusted, a God who loves us and knows exactly what we need. Maybe you're desperate for God to provide. I say all the time, everyone here is in a battle. Different battle for every person, some big, some small. But every person is in a battle. Some within yourself, some with others. We are all fighting a fight. And there are people in here who are waiting for God to provide. Maybe you're desperate today for him to provide physically, for healing, emotionally, or spiritually. Maybe you're in a spot where he needs to grab you and put you on his back and carry you. You've seen that picture. Usually it's in stained glass where Jesus looks all peaceful and he's walking with a sheep on his back and he's got the legs around him. He's just carrying the sheep along. I usually look at that picture and I'm like, oh gosh, what sanitized Christianity is that? No, it's perfect Christianity. It is the picture of what Jesus has done for us. Because when you think about it, when we recognize who we are in light of who God is, when we can honestly say the Lord is my shepherd, it requires that when we look back at our lives and you count the seasons of hardship, the trials, the pain, when you look back on who you have been and where you have been brought by the good shepherd, what I begin to realize, what I pray you would realize that he's been carrying us a lot of the journey already. That a lot of the journey already, he has us on his back. That you and I think we're doing it. But the good shepherd, when we are in trouble, when we are injured, when we are in, in, in danger, the good shepherd has never left it to chance. He takes on our weight and he carries us through over and over and over again. And so the decisions I'm most terrified of making, the paths I'm most terrified of walking, the places in my life I don't know what's coming next or what I'm supposed to do, all of the sudden, if I'm in the hands of the shepherd, there's nothing I should want. And there's nothing I should fear, because he has me. The good shepherd provides everything we need, and he wants nothing less than everything you ever needed to be provided. And he's proven that in Jesus all you'll ever need. And yet he's not some distant God. He knows that every day there is a new set of things that his children need. And you and I have this list of wants. And what I yearn for is the ability in my own life to every day root myself and say, God, you are all that I need. And therefore, all the things I want pale in comparison to who you are, and I can trust you to provide good things. So today we get to celebrate that. 
the band's gonna come back out and we're gonna close with a song and, and celebrate that we have a good shepherd. Celebrate that we have a God who has not given up on us, that will never forsake us, that looks down upon us and says, I love you this much, and we get to look back and go, oh, how I love you too. We have a good shepherd and a great God. And so while we're gonna celebrate together, we're gonna sing together, there are still people in this room that are not there, that are in a place where when I say I can look back in my life and see where God has carried me, you're going, I need something to carry me now because you don't know what I'm going through. And this is a safe place to be that way. And so what I wanna offer you is we're gonna have our prayer team on either side of the stage on the edges, but I also wanna leave the front of the stage open. If you need time with God, if you need to return and come back to the shepherd. Maybe you've been far from God and you go, you know what, I wanna celebrate with everyone else, but I gotta get right first. I wanna offer you the chance to just come and kneel, spend your time with God. Kneel before the Father, the shepherd who loves you. Get right for this journey ahead. If you need to pray with someone, if you're going through something and you just need someone to pray with you, pray over you, you need to tell somebody something that's been just eating at your soul. That's why we have folks that are gonna be up here when the song starts. Maybe you need to celebrate with somebody. Maybe God's already provided in an incredible way. And you just wanna share his goodness. And that's what we're here to do is share his goodness with you. So as we sing, we remember we have a good shepherd. The Lord is our good shepherd. And in him, there's nothing we shall want.